Everybody turn your uh, Bibles to John chapter 13 and verse 34. And this verse, um, these, well, these two next two verses that I'm about to read, um, they were part of my um, devotions at camp. Um, when, when I had flag football, we, um, there was one day where we would do, I forgot what game it was, but I think it was some kind of different flag game where the kids wore different color flags, so, you know, separated them up into two teams. And um, the, the big question that, de- we call them debriefs, not devotions, but the big thing in that debrief was, um, you know, how how did you know that teams were separated? And they said, obviously, by the color of your flag. And I said, yeah, that's right. So um, the next question was, so if, or excuse me, the next question was, uh, how do people know, what se- excuse me, what separates us Christians from other people? And these are verses, so let's read it. It says, um, and I'm reading from a newer, kind of modern translation, but um, that's the NLT up there, so if you get confused, I'm sorry. All right, verse 34, it says, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to also love one another. Oh, excuse me. You are to also love one another. Verse 35 says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for... Uh, Two great services we've had already, God. I thank you for what you're going to do for the rest of the service. Uh, God, I pray that um, you speak through me and give these people the, the, words to, uh, the words that they need to hear and give me the words to say to these people and uh, realize that um, it's important to learn how to love other people. And God, it's not because we loved you, it's because you loved us first. And, and God, I pray that these people can grasp that and hopefully use it as we walk out of these walls and so God, be with me tonight, speak through me, and open up our hearts and minds to what you'd have us to receive from you today, God. And it's your name I pray, amen. All right, so I just got, a, um, I just got three quick points um, of, I mean, they're, they're broad points, but we can, we can all somehow take something from each of these points. And um, so my question is, I mean, you don't have to answer it, it says, why isn't the church today loving effectively you don't have to answer that but I this has really been on my heart for a very very long time um, even at camp because you you don't know what kind of you know these children that come to camp come to camp you don't know what kind of home life they have and you don't know what they're going through at home and you don't know how much love they receive from their parents or guardians so they they really honed on us to love these kids like they're our own and and it makes an impact it really does to seeing these kids lives change just from five days all because you love them and I, I got to thinking about it it's, it's, it doesn't just have to just apply to these kids it can apply to anybody on this earth and the more I think about it and the more I the more I look around the world I'm like how why is the church not loving these people effectively and why why are these churches like shutting down and all this well God, God said in the Bible our, the greatest thing that he's given to us is his love and if we're not utilizing that then we're in trouble so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm give you a few points tonight about how the church is straying away from the love that God has given us and the first one is that the re- first reason that we're not loving people effectively is that we love ourselves too much. We're being selfish. And um, with the selfishness, bec- it comes with pride, and it comes with judgment, and it comes with, um, I have a point that says, we're concerned about being right, and I'll get that to a moment. But anyways, when we come to church, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything against him, I'm talking about the, the church in general, most of these churches today, we're, not, we're being taught how to live the right way. And so we use that. But then when we go outside these walls, we're so concerned about living the right way that, and we think we're living the right way that we shun the people that aren't living the right way. And with that becomes a, 
what I call a, a better, I'm better than you attitude. And that's a problem. Because Jesus didn't do that. That's a pro- it's, it's a problem because we can't love others if we think we're better than them. And it, it causes us to be closed-minded to who we hang around and the virtues that we look for in people. And when we're selfish like this and we're closed-minded, we, we pick and choose who we hang around. We pick and choose to, uh, like, who we, who we want to associate with. And we, so we create this image of people in the way that they should be. And when they don't fit that image, then we shun them and we judge them. And that's what happens when we can be selfish and say, like, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just this Christian. You know, they talked about the Pharisees back in the day. They thought they were self-righteous and they thought they were the bomb diggity. And, and they, they, they looked down on others because they were these high religious officials. And it's because they picked and choose who they hung around and picked and choose who they let into their tables and, and who they let into their houses and who they associated with. And Jesus did not like that. Just like Christopher said this morning, Jesus... They, they looked down on Jesus because he was hanging out with the sinners at a table. And because we think we're all high and mighty, we tend to judge people that aren't like us. And we, so we point out these people, you know, they're a Christian. Yeah, okay, that's good. They go to church. They, you know, they listen to this music. I like that music. And they, we have this image and we have all these categories that we want these people to fill. And as soon as they don't fill one of those categories, we put them to the side. And that's not what Jesus wants us to do. And the Bible tells us to come as you are. And when we're on, and we, when we put people to the side and they come and they see us, you know, trying to live a life of Christ, but we think, you know, us Christians, we're, we're all high and mighty and we're living a better life than you are. But when they come, us, come to us to get answers and try to find out how to live a better life, we put them to the side. And the Bible tells us to come as you are. So when people come at, to us as they are, we put them to the side because we don't care. And that's the sad truth. Because it's just we don't care. If, if you have those selfish tendencies, then those people are being pushed to the side. But here's, what I wanna, here's what I want to get to. When, when we have this, these selfish tendencies, we, we're more concerned about being right Versus being affected. I said this last time I was up here talking about can't. The last maybe 10 minutes or so. I talked about the difference between being right and being effective. Well, I said that the church today. I'm trying to think of what I said that night. It's, I said that the church today is being, not being taught how to. Or we're being taught how to live the right way. But we're not being taught how to love other people. And I, I went back and watched that. And I was like, I need to clear this up a lot. We are being taught how to love other people, but we sit here in the pews and we sit and they talk about loving other people and we sit here and say, yes, amen, preach it, brother. But when we walk out those doors, we think nothing else about it. And it's because we think we have it all figured out already. And we come into this church, we come into this church, you know, we, thinking that we all have it figured out and that we don't have to listen to the message anymore. And we don't have to apply the message to our lives anymore. And that's where we get in trouble because we think we already have it figured out. And we are in such big trouble if we do that. Because I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are, something in these messages, okay, can be applied to your life. I told somebody at camp that I get these verses of the day on my phone. I have a Bible app on my phone and they send out verses of the day. And... What was great about it is this is, this is how God works. Through all, all throughout camp, I told you it was, it was physically, emotionally, all this is exhausting. And almost every single day at camp, I saw a verse about, it's just encouraging verses. You know, like keeping the faith and keep pressing on toward the goals that God's given you and all this other stuff about encouragement. And that's just God working. But I told somebody at camp, I was like, I get these verses of the day on my phone and I sit there and I, I try to apply it to my life that day. And see how, see what, in what area in my life, maybe I'll have an in, encounter with somebody that I can apply this um, perception to my day. And it, it worked out a lot because there would be sometimes I'll be talking to a kid uh, about Jesus and that verse will pop into my head. 
and I, I can tell that kid that verse. And, but, I'm kind of getting off topic here, but we can, we can take something out of these messages that Papa and Brother Rich and all, all of us preach and go apply it to our lives, but because we're selfish and we think we all have, we think we all have it figured out, we don't apply it. And because we don't apply that message to our lives and we think we all have it figured out, these people that need Jesus, we're not going to them and being effective like we need to be. And, and, that, and that's the truth. It's sad, but it's true. And that's not what the church needs to be. So what's the solution to that? What's the solution to being selfish? One of Papa's favorite verses. I'm going to get you to help me out right here. All right. Second Chronicles 7.14 But if my people who are called by my name shall what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. I can't tell you how many times in the Bible it says you need to humble yourself before the Lord. And when we don't humble ourselves before the Lord, that's, that causes those selfish tendencies. When we don't have our acts right with God, those selfish tendencies and the devil starts to creep into your mind saying, oh, you're living a better life than them. You don't even have to worry about them. And they, he comes, he, he just tells us all this stuff that's not true. That, and it's, it's the opposite of what Jesus taught us and what we should be reading in our Bibles. But we need to be humbled before God does it for us. And because if you don't humble yourself, then God's going to do it for you one way or another. And sometimes that's kind of scary to think about because, you know, if you don't humble yourself, then God's going to do it for you. Oh, that means something bad's going to happen in my life. And I don't want that to happen. You know, I don't want that to happen either. That's why we need to humble ourselves now before it happens later. And it may not happen here on this earth, but on that day that Jesus comes back, then you'll be humble for sure. Because the, my Bible tells me that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And we will all be humbled. So I say, church, today, it's better to do it now than it is when that day comes. Because if you're not humble now, you can never love people effectively like we should, like Jesus did, because we're so caught up in ourselves. And we're so worried about ourselves. John the Baptist um, we read about him baptizing people in, in Jesus' name. But when Jesus finally came on this earth and um, got baptized by John, and John chapter 3, um, in a nutshell, it just says that, you know, John, John the Baptist was in the river baptizing people. And then Jesus and his, you know, John, had, John the Baptist had his disciples that followed him. And then Jesus had his 12 disciples that followed him. And they went to separate rivers, and they baptized people. And they heard that about Jesus baptizing people over at this place. So they started leaving John and going over to him, or they would never even come to John in the first place. They would go straight to Jesus. And John's, John the Baptist's disciples got irritated at that. And they, they said, um, in verse 26, it says, Rab this is John's disciples talking to John the Baptist. It says, Rabbi, the one you testified about, about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him and I read this in a way that it's like oh John they're going to that person over there they're not coming to you anymore and they're and they're worried and their friend oh excuse me that scared me but <laughs> but but John's answer was the best answer that I could have ever thought of. Because starting in verse 28, it says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. But I have been sent ahead of him. And it says, he who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. So John, just like a, a groomsman, just like the, the groom's best man stands beside him, and he's so happy for his groom. Um, yeah, that's what John's saying, that he is compared to Jesus. No, Jesus has the center of attention now that he's here. But John's now standing in the back. He's done his part now. And verse 31, we all know this. It says, he must increase and I must decrease. That's the definition of humility right there. Because John could have easily been mad that people were going to Jesus and going to him instead of coming to John. 
they were going to Jesus. He could have been mad at that. He could have been so upset. But John knew his place. John was so humbled by the fact that Jesus was greater than him that he was not upset at all. Even, like, if I were John, in that perspective, in his perspective, I would have been happy because I wouldn't have to deal with all these people anymore. And just think about it. You know, you know John is coming getting all these people to get baptized and then they're all starting to follow over there to Jesus and they're not coming to him anymore. I'm mean, being like, that's a relief, you know? But I mean, John loved what he did, but when Jesus started taking over, he said, let them go to Jesus. I don't want them to come to me because he's the Messiah. I'm not. You know, verse 27 it says, I, you can testify that I said that I am not the Messiah. So some of us today, we go around thinking that we're all high and mighty, that we can be the Messiah. You know, we, we don't want to admit that, but it's true. We walk around thinking that we're, we're Christ-like and that we're maybe, maybe think of ourselves as greater than Christ because we tend to put our needs over the ones that Christ wants us to um, prioritize. We, we put our needs in a higher priority than Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. And what happens is that we don't think that God is higher than we are because we don't think anything's going to happen. Nothing, happened, has, nothing has happened to us at this point that's humbled us, so we, we never think it's going to come. But God said when he comes back, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And that's when we're going to be humbled. It may, it may not happen here on this earth, and it may, it may too. So. But when he comes back, then you'll be humbled. And we don't need to be in that position. And that's when it's all over. That's when done is done, because if you're not going up into heaven, that's it. And we need to realize that we need to get it now before we're like, uh-oh, later. You feel me? So... That's the first uh, reason. The second reason, you know, the, fir the first one was we love ourselves too much. And the second reason was that, um, is that we don't love ourselves enough. Christopher kind of hardened on this this morning is that we have to love ourselves too. And, and um, I think that's very important to love ourselves. This isn't, you know, oh, I love myself. This ain't, this ain't one of those where you, where you're, because that's being selfish. Yeah. Yeah, y'all got to kick out of that. But this isn't one of those. This is where, by this, I mean that you accept yourself for who Christ made you to be. It doesn't mean that you, you love yourself more than anything. It means that you just accept who Christ and God has made you to be. So let's turn to Matthew 22. Um, verse 36 it says uh, teacher which command in the law is the greatest and this is when the Pharisees um, were coming and asking questions to Jesus to try to catch him off guard um, it says verse 37 it says he said to him love the Lord your God with all your heart with all, the sh with all your soul and with all your mind this is the greatest and most important command and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself now, I want you to go back to, go to verse 39 for me, if you can. There it goes. Now, this is my version. It says, the second is like it. But you see, the NLT says, the second is as equally important. You know, Jesus, they were looking for one answer, the Pharisees were, when they asked him this question, but he gave them two. And he said, the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And he said, the, the second is as equally important. This isn't like, you know, this is one and number two. He's like, this is one A and one B right here. This is what he's saying. And yes, it says love your neighbor. And that's what we harn on all the time is loving your neighbor. But there's a, prere there's a prerequisite to loving your neighbor. It says love your neighbor as what? Yourself. We can only love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. Why do you think there's so much bullying now in America? It's because those bullies find something in the people that they bully, that they want, so they, they tend to harm that other person because of it. We can only love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. If we don't love ourselves enough, and we don't accept ourselves as Christ made us to be, we can never love those people effectively. And by effectively, I mean as a point to where it's changing. 
I, I read some synonyms on this word. It said fruitful. You know, the word affected is fruitful. And the Bible talks about, you know, be, bearing fruit. And we, we read, you know, loving people is highly important now. And ever since I, I, I listened to this, I listened to this pastor, okay? His name is Michael Todd. He's, he has a church out in um, Texas, I think. But anyways, uh, he, he had these verses. And the, I was watching this series on relationships. And it's it was, it was called Relationship Goals. But he, he was talking about how, how you, in your, um, excuse me. He was talking about in this particular um, video that it's important that you learn to love yourself before you can ever love somebody. And that's what he said. You can only love yourself you can only love others as much as you love yourself. And he said that your, this was talking about relationships, but it said your singleness is probably one of the most important times in your life. And the more I thought about it, I was like, he's exactly right. You know, even when you're married, you still have your singleness, okay? Uh, don't get me wrong. When you're married, you, ha you still have your singleness. You're not single, but you have your singleness, your own individual relationship with God, okay? And when your singleness is so damaged, you can never, we, we look to other people to come satisfy that damage. And when it doesn't work out, we wonder what happened. And it's because we never learn to love ourselves. And let's see. And when we, when we learn, kind of shifting gears, when we, when we, what did it say? When we don't learn to love ourselves, that's when we start comparing ourselves to other things. And guys, let me tell you, the, the, the art of comparison is a dangerous place to be in. And it's when we start comparing ourselves to other people and other things is when we get in deep, deep trouble. And um, we can never love ourselves effectively if we're always comparing ourselves to other people. You know, we look at other people, and social media is the worst at this. I think that today's generation is, is in trouble by, because of social media, like, for this reason, because of social media. And it's happened to me. Cause I, I know this firsthand because I've been comparing myself to other, I've compared myself to other people that I've seen on social media, and I'm like, why can't I have that? Why, why can't I look like that? Yeah, can you believe that? Why can't I look like that? And we never accept ourselves for who we are and who Christ made us to be. Because we are all made in Christ's image. And God made us our, this way for a reason. And when we tend to compare, our, compare ourselves and who Christ made us to be to somebody else, that's when, we, that's when the devil starts playing with our minds. And coming in, it's like, you're not good enough. You are not worthy of this. You, Jesus is not going to love you because you are being like this. And today's generation and even generations beforehand I'm not saying it's just today's generation today's generation and other generations are going to be in deep deep trouble if they keep thinking that and they I want all these people to grasp that you have to accept yourself for who you are before you can go loving other people because you are never going to be them you're never going to be that person that you compare yourself to and you know, <laughs> I've been driving this this car SUV that was awesome. That was I'm I'm grateful for it. Okay, gets me from point A to point B. I love it. Okay, but we've had so many problems with it. Okay, I've been driving this thing for two and a half years now, and we're on the verge of getting something new. Okay, I'm happy about that. But I've been driving this thing for it's in the back here. I got I've been driving it for two and a half years now. And what happened at first is before I, I finally came to know Christ, I, I started comparing myself to other people that had nicer cars than me. You know, why can't I have that right there? You know, I want that. Dude, I want your truck. I would come up to people, but your truck is nice. I want that. And I would come to mine, and I'd be like, man, it's not his. I don't, I don't want this. And, but, but when I finally came to the realization that, you know, I love that. I have so much a greater appreciation for that than I do than I, well, than I did, excuse me, because, you know, I realized that it could be worse. I could not have anything at all, you know? Yeah, the amen's right here in the front. <laughs> you know, I could not have anything at all. 
So I have so much more of a, an appreciation for that. And I, and I love, I mean, I love the thing, but I mean, it's breaking down, okay? <laughs> and that's what happens is that, you know, we, we see, you know, it doesn't have to just be like, like, you know, clothes-wise. It can be like personality, you know. Some person may have another characteristic that you want in your life. You know, they could, okay, let's just go, you know, I know some girls are like, oh, I wish I could be as pretty as she is. And some dudes might, might look at, you know, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, man, I wish I was ripped as he was, you know. And <laughs> yeah, and we, we tend to compare ourselves and we never, we are, we will never be satisfied if we keep comparing ourselves to other people and when we don't love ourselves enough we will never learn to love other people because in this verse it says love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself you will never learn how to love other people and um you know comparing ourselves can also cause us to be ungrateful about what we do have and I, I've come to a more realization of that too. You know, I'm grateful for that car now. I wasn't at first, to be on, I mean, being honest here. I'm, I'm sorry, but being honest, I was not. <laughs> you know, I, you know I'm, I'm turning, you know, 16, 17. And I, I mean, I don't have a truck yet. Like, what's happening? And then they give me this. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? They, they know how I feel about it, so I'm not getting in trouble here. But I, I have such, I have, I'm so much grateful for that now. And I have to come to a realization that, you know, it could be worse. God's given me what he's given me for a reason. And when we expect more from God, that's when we get in trouble. Because sometimes we, we pray to God about raising what we have now, like giving us more. And because we're not satisfied, because we don't love what we have already, and and because we're not satisfied, we go to God saying, God, give me more. And we, I mean, in, in a blunt way, it's like, give me more. God, I don't like the job I'm at, so give me a better job. And then two weeks later, you find out you don't have a job at all. Yeah, and then, you know, God, give me a good crop this year. And then, you know, next week you have weevils in your thing and you, you can't grow crops at all. You know, God, like... I need a raise like right now because I, I have so much bill I have so I have so many bills to pay right now and I just can't do it. And then you get a demotion at your job. Why does God do that? It's it's to it's to make us trust him more. It's to make us be more appreciative of what we did have. I mean he does it in a lo- he does it in a hard way, but it's a loving way because and it, he loves us. He never does anything out of hate. Okay? To, to us he never does anything out of hate he does it solely out of love yeah it hurts us okay and he's hurt that we're hurt but he had to do it because he loves us you know just like remember when I was a kid and I, I was I tended to be a bad kid sometimes and you know my parents would come and whip me and they would always tell me or mom did at least I don't know about daddy but mom mom would always tell me this hurts me more than it hurts you has anybody ever heard that yeah, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until just recently, well, not, not just recently, but within the last few years, what exactly that meant. You know, sometimes God gives us tests and he gives us these trials and it hurts us and it hurts him, but he does it in a loving way. My parents disciplined me because they loved me. And I had to realize that. And I'm so thankful for it now. I didn't like it. It hurt a lot. I had smiley faces on my, on my hind parts, okay, because of the paddle that we use. But, <laughs> yeah, y'all embarrassed me enough. It's my turn now. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm grateful for it. I, I really am grateful for it. I would never, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for the discipline that my parents show me. And these are just my earthly parents and God is our heavenly parent, you know? He, he looks down on us in love and when we mess up, yeah, there's going to be consequences, but it's because he loves us. And we have to realize that. So when we can't accept ourselves, when we can't love ourselves, what's the solution to that? 
Here, here's what I put down. It says, to, to effectively love ourselves, we have to realize who he is first. And who is he? He's, he's the God. He's God, yeah. But he's, you know, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's our, the Savior of the world. And the more I thought about this, the more, the more amazed I become at God. He's, he's our physician. He's, our, he's the great physician. He, he is this and he's that all for us. He is the father to orphans. He is the, the, he's Alpha and Omega and all this. We have to realize how great he is and then we can start accepting who we are. And, and who are we? We are accepted. We are loved. We are an image bearer of Christ. And we are forgiven. And there's so many other things I could say. But when we realize who God is, then we can realize we are all these things right here that I just read. And that's, and that's how we learn to accept ourselves and who we are in Christ. And um, I had this illustration I was going to say, but it completely left my mind. So that, the first reason was, you know, we love ourselves too much. Second reason is that we don't love ourselves enough and then the third reason is that we're not loving God like we should and that's the most important all right so let's take it back to John chapter 13 real quick um, but I've noticed that the the church is straying away from loving other people like it should because we're grasping the wrong concepts about what we're being taught. We're being taught to live the right way, but we bottle it up to ourselves. We're being taught how to love other people, and we're being taught that we are loved by God, but we're bottling it up to ourselves. And we wonder why things don't happen in our lives. It's because we're not going out and expressing what we learn to other people. And that's how people learn that they're loved by God too. So when, when, we, when things aren't adding up, then it's time to evaluate us. When you look ourselves in the mirror, what am I doing wrong? And that, that comes with a lot of humility. It's a, it's a hard thing to do, okay? It's a hard thing that we need to look at ourselves in the mirror. What can I do differently? And the thing is, we're not loving God like we should. And that's important. Um, I, had, I had somebody tell me one time in high school that they don't like going to church anymore because the people there are fake. And that hit me so hard. And, the more, and that's been in my mind ever since I've agreed to share tonight. That people don't like going to church anymore. That they went to church and that they just kind of go every now and then, but they don't want to go anymore because the people there are the fakest people they've ever met. And this goes back to the selfish thing I was talking about is that we think we're all high and mighty. So when people come in and they, they're looking to be loved, they're looking to be helped, we don't. And when they don't feel loved and then they don't feel help, they walk out and they turn away and the rest is history. And that's our fault, okay? That's our fault. The church should not be recognized for being fake the church like he, he he told us a couple weeks ago before all this happens that God told him that this church was supposed to be a hospital right what happens in hospitals sick people come in you give them the stuff they need to get better but then what happens they leave would you rather them leave with the the healing that they have or turn back without any recognition at all you rather have them that healing, right? So it's up to us as a church to adopt those into our family, love them, give them the things that they need, show them how to live the right way, show, show them who God is, show them that God loves them, and then if, if, and if it's in God's will for them to leave, then they can go. But our problem is, is that people come in these walls and we're being, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm talking about in, in the church in general, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about justice, I'm talking about the church in general. They come into these churches' walls, they're being neglected, and then they go away. And that's not what Jesus did. Yes, Jesus was the Messiah, 
And he knew that. He knew that he was the son of God. He told everybody that he was the son of God, but he did not boast in it. And what we're doing is that Christians, we, we boast in the fact that we're Christians. And we boast in the fact that, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday. You know, I read my Bible every now and then. I do this and that. I pay my tithes. Yeah. And, you know, since you don't do that, I'm better than you. We, <laughs> we're not going to admit that, but it's the truth. No, we, we look down on others because they have a different background than we do. Maybe they come from a, a rougher home life, but we, you know, we, and they're different than us. Just like Christopher talked about this morning, you know, they're, they're different. But why shouldn't we invite them to our table? You won't know how good of a person they are until you actually get to know them. And we can't get to know them if we're shunning them away. And, you know, I read this, um, these verses to my kids and I made sure they know. I was like, um, can non-Christians still love? And they looked at me and they were like, you know, now that I think about it, yeah, they can yeah, non-Christians can still love. Non-Christian people can still love. But what separates us Christians from non-Christians is God's love, okay? And when we don't have God's love in our hearts, we can never love people effectively if we don't have God's love in our hearts. That's why I make sure to tell these kids at camp is that you have to have God's love in your heart. You can't just go out and love other people you know, non-Christians, non-Christian people can say they love you. Okay, I've had non-Christian people tell me they love me. Just because of the person I am. But what separates Christians from other people is about the way we love each other. And that's what it says in this verse. Is this, and it, in these two verses, Jesus says this three times. Love one another. I don't know about you, but when a teacher tells me something three times, I'm going to write it down. Actually, I probably wouldn't write it down, but I'll probably remember it. You know, because I wasn't really a note taker. Ha ha, that was supposed to be funny. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but if we're coming up short to God's standards for our life, then we need to reevaluate, church. And we need to realize that we can never effectively love people if we're not living up to God's standards. We cannot have the full love of Christ overflowing out of us if we are not doing what we're supposed to do. And that's where the hardest part comes in. That's when you need to have a self-evaluation about yourself and what am I doing wrong? And, you know, Jesus, he came on this earth and he came to win who? Anybody? Jesus came to win the lost. Jesus didn't come to save his people. You know, he had his chosen people. But I mean, we're all his people, right? And he didn't just come to save the Christians that already believed in him. He came to save the people who didn't know him at all. And the people that don't know Christ at all, now in today's time, that's, all, that's us as Christians' fault. Because we, we bottle up everything that we're being taught and we're not using it and going to show other people what we've learned. And... That's a no-no, a big, big no-no. And here, here's a, a way where you can think about it. In Romans 5.8, it says, while we were still what? Sinners. Who died for us? Christ died for us. It didn't say while we were still, while we were still sinning Christians. No, it didn't say that. It said while we were still sinners. We are all sinners. The Bible tells us we, are, there's, we all fall short of the glory of God. You can have one sinner in your life and that qualifies you as a sinner. I don't care how righteous you think you are, okay? I don't care how bad you think you are. We're all sinners, okay? And we have to come to that realization that I've messed up too, okay? But Jesus came in my life and he made that mess a masterpiece and he can do the same for you as long as you follow him. And that's what we need to grasp is that God can change people's lives, but we have to be willing to go out and change people's lives for him. You know, you know God does the changing, like he, he does the changing, but we can help them. We can love on them and show them how Christ's life 
what it really is to live a life for Christ, okay? And we have to connect with those people, okay? Just like Christopher said this morning, you have to invite those people to your table first before you can get to know them. The first thing that has to happen is you have to send an invite. You know, you have to connect with those people and then once that connection is made, then the change can start happening because they'll see Christ in you and they, won't, they, won't want, they will not want anything else. And I, I just think this, this topic is super, super important for us Christians to understand is that today's society is leaning away from the love that we need to be shown. Why do you think politics is so divided right now? Why, why do you think half of this side is this and half of this side is this? It's because we're not showing the love to other people. This is, this is what I'm talking about with being right. You know, one side is more concerned about being right than the other one. You know, everybody, anybody watch these sports shows, the sports talk shows, you know, we have two people that debate all the time. You know, Steve A. Smith, Max Kellerman, Shannon Sharp, um, and the other guy, I can't think of his name, but me and Paul were talking about this the other day, and, and you know, they, these guys can agree with the same thing, but because of, the, of TV purposes, it's their job to disagree with the other person, okay? And that's, what ha that's what's happening with politics, too, is that one side says this, okay? The Republicans say this, and since the Republicans say this, the Democrats say the exact opposite. And that's not being loved. That's being separated. My Bible tells me that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And when we're being separated by that, we're in trouble. Okay? It's, it's our job as Christians to take that separation and fuse it back together. And we can't do that if we love ourselves too much. We can't do that if we love ourselves if we don't love ourselves enough, and we can't do that if we're not loving God the way that we should. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, well, I want you guys to grasp this concept and that we have to reevaluate who we are and how we're being loved, and we have to take our, our rightful place, okay? We can't, we can't try to establish a place where we're not. We can't put ourselves on a, this high pedestal where we don't deserve to be. Okay, we have to realize who we are, where we are, and accept ourselves. And then we can show other people how to get there too. Does that make sense? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this, this, other, this another opportunity to preach your word to these uh, awesome, awesome people, God. And I pray that people realize that, it, God, loving other people is just as important as anything else. God, you tell us to go and make disciples of all nations, but we can't do that if, we're, if we want to stay in our comfort zone and stay, stay right here. God, we have to embrace the uncomfortable and go out and love those people that deserve to be loved just as much as we do. God, you didn't come just to die for, for us. You came to die for them all. Even the people that don't want anything to do with you, you die for those people too. And it's our job as Christians to go and take those people in, from the lost and make them found again. And God, I just thank you for um, everything that you've done tonight and, th and this morning. And I thank you for what you're going to do. And so God, let us apply this in a way that um, we never had before to our lives. And it's in your name I pray.